Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed Remus, the Social Sciences Librarian here at Northeastern. On behalf of the NEIU Libraries and in celebration of Banned Books Week, which we commemorated last week, I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's event. I would also like to thank those who helped make this event possible. Funding for this event has been provided by the George Mason University's Voices for Liberty Initiative. The Voices for Liberty Initiative is examining the role free speech has played and continues to play in advancing civil rights in America, particularly for historically disadvantaged and or socially marginalized groups. Other supporters of today's event include the NEIU Political Science Department, the NEIU History Department, and the NEIU History Club. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, Crystalyn Ortiz. Crystalyn Ortiz received her undergraduate degree in history from Northeastern with a minor in anthropology. In 2021, she founded the NEIU History Club and she has served as president of the club since that year. She is also a member of Phi Alpha Theta, the National History Honor Society. In 2022, Crystalyn began pursuing a Master of Arts in History at Northeastern which with a teacher's licensure for secondary education. This past summer, she was awarded the Diversifying Faculty in Illinois Fellowship, the goal of which is to increase the number of minority full-time tenure-track faculty and staff at two and four-year public and private universities and colleges in Illinois. After earning her MA at Northeastern, Crystalline plans to pursue a PhD. Thank you so much for having me. 
I can say I had the privilege of collaborating with uh, Ed Remus on a number of projects and also with Crystal on a number of projects. Uh, I, today I've had the opportunity to meet these impressive student leaders as well as other members of your library faculty uh, and student and, uh, body and I have to say I'm so impressed by the wonderful educational atmosphere here and the dedication to perpetuating the best that education has to offer by becoming teachers yourselves in, in many cases. And I'm showing my, um, my support for your school by wearing one of your school colors, the blue. Thank you for having a very pretty school color. <laughs> so um, just an introductory question, Dean. Um, I just wanted to know, what drew you to studying law and the concept, because you do distinguish between the concept and the, like, the legal definition of free speech. So what made you focus on free speech specifically for so much of your career? For as far back as I can remember, Crystal, we agreed we'd be on a first name basis with each other as free speech and educational colleagues. Uh, as far back as I can remember, I've had an intuitive sense about human freedom and dignity and equality. And as I grew older and learned that there are legal protections for what I, uh, I wouldn't have had the vocabulary at the time, but perceived as inherent human rights belonging to every human being. Uh, as I learned that there were legal protections that existed, at least in theory, that was thrilling, but even more thrilling was learning that there are organizations and individuals who are dedicating their missions to translating those ideals into a reality, a lived reality, which is a never-ending project. Uh, throughout my adult lifetime, I have been a full-time human rights advocate. I uh, was drawn to the ACLU, even though I support and am active in many other organizations, but the ACLU has a signature mission, which in my mind parallels the obligation of our government, which is to defend and promote all rights for all people, no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, you are entitled to full and equal human rights. So there are some organizations that specialize in specific rights. There are some organizations that specialize in rights of particular groups of people. Those are all very important, but I think it's essential uh, to have an organization that's at least trying its best, as our government should try its best, to uh, neutrally protect all rights. And I have come to believe that the most essential engine for promoting all human rights, and for that matter, for promoting any cause whatsoever, including opposition to human rights, is freedom of speech. So in my waning years, as I have to be even more careful about how I allocate my time, I've decided that, uh, and this has been true for since about 2016, uh, that I would essentially work full time in trying to increase information about an understanding of free speech because it is being attacked from both ends of the ideological spectrum, I think largely because of misunderstanding about what free speech really is. And I'm so thrilled that all of you are members of the History Club, and I met Matthew, another member of the History Club out there, um, because the more you know about the history that gave rise to our current free speech guarantees, and the more you know about the history of censorship that preceded them, the more supportive you become. I think if you focus only on the present, you can take for granted um, the enormous benefits that come only from robust freedom of speech. Thank you, Nadine, for your insight. Uh, that was very, very inspiring. Um, speaking on attacking free speech, 
Uh, we've seen content censored out of Florida history textbooks after the passing of the 2022 Florida House Bill 7, also known as HB 7. Uh, speaking about HB 7, Governor Ron DeSantis has said the following, quote, in Florida we will not let the far left, let the far left woke agenda take over our schools and workplaces. There is no place for indoctrination and discrimination in Florida, end quote. The ACLU filed a lawsuit to fight HB 7, and a Florida judge was ultimately able to put a temporary block on select sections of HB 7. Um, what are your thoughts on states and school boards' rights to determine the curriculum for school districts, and where is the limit to what can and cannot be uh, banned in the curriculum? Very sophisticated series of questions, Jessica, and I'll try not to uh, be too take too long in answering them. Uh, but, you know, let's start with what Ron DeSantis said. He said that indoctrination and discrimination have no part in our curriculum. We all agree with that, right? So, so far, so good. And, and it's so important that you, and I'm sure you chose this very interesting question because it relates to teaching, which all of you are going to be engaged in, and so many of you are engaged in as well. And I know that you are all very conscientious. You want to do with your students the opposite of indoctrination, just as your wonderful teachers and librarians are doing here. What's the opposite of indoctrination? It's to stimulate critical thinking and critical inquiry. Now, the sad thing is, and you all have had excellent teaching, although I know, uh, Michael, you and I exchanged anecdotes about we each had one bad teacher. <laughs> but that's not, that's the averages are pretty good given how many teachers we've had. Sadly, any topic can be taught in an indoctrinating way. And by the way, in a boring way. I can't tell you how many students I've met who have said, oh, Kong Law was so boring. I think, how can you possibly make that a boring subject? So anyway, starting with the positive, um, the goal of preventing indoctrination and encouraging teachers to encourage critical analysis and thinking and questioning and dissenting and multiple perspectives, that's all to the good. But the supposed cure is to outlaw discussion of critically important topics and the airing of important perspectives on those topics, uh, which is why a number of people who like, oppose uh, so-called critical race studies, and I put that in quotation marks because it's a very, um, nobody knows exactly what it means and the term is bandied about in different ways, uh, but even historians and other experts who oppose that topic, and that was of course one of the major targets of the, of the Florida law, have said, but this law does more harm than good. Because in the name of opposing indoctrination, it's in fact imposing its own form of indoctrination. So, you know, the old saying, two wrongs don't make a right. And the federal judge who, and the lawsuit was brought not only by the ACLU, but by a very ideologically diverse group of organizations, including FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. And the judge who ruled against the law said that it is positively dystopian. He made me think of Orwell's 1984. And remember Newspeak, the language where words were the opposite of the actual meaning, so love is hate and war is peace, and here anti-indoctrination turns out to be indoctrination. So let's take the good impetus underlying that law, but let's implement it in a way that um, facilitates, you know, helps, I know all of you are involved in exercises to inject and reinvigorate the classroom with critical analysis and the opposite of indoctrination, especially on these critically important subjects of race and gender that were at the focus of the, of the law. Thank you. That was a really 
really interesting answer. Thank you. I think you convey your message really well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, continuing the conversation on uh, school content, um, private schools are not required to submit a curriculum to state education boards, and they're not held to state education board requirements. Um, how far can private schools push the limits of exercising their right to determine their own curriculum before state boards are legally capable of intervening? Um, where does the law draw the line there? Where should it draw the line? Thank you so much, Jessica, for that follow-up question because it gives me an opportunity to segue into it by answering the last of the series of questions that you had initially asked me, which was um, who sets the curriculum, right? And that's I didn't specifically answer that with respect to public schools, and then we'll segue into private schools. Um, I've always considered the law about these issues to be especially important and especially difficult because uh, it is it emblemizes epitomizes the paradox, if you will, at the center of our form of government. On the one hand, we're a democratic republic. The Constitution opens with those famous words, "We the people." Because we, the people, wield sovereign power. That means through officials, we uh, majorities elect to be accountable to the majoritarian forces among their constituency. But, and, and that means that the vast, vast, vast majority of public policy issues, including what should be in a curriculum, what should the standards be for public and private schools, all of these issues are basically decided by officials who are accountable to the majority in their community, so a majoritarian approach. However, the framers in their wisdom did not create a pure democracy. They said there are certain rights that are so fundamental that no majority, no matter how large, may take them away from any minority, no matter how small or despised that minority might be. And that paradox, uh, we lawyers often refer to it as the counter-majoritarian difficulty. You know, why should these unelected Supreme Court judges get to strike down laws that are very popular? Let's take the law in Florida, for example, with at least the federal district court. Uh, just one single person struck down a law that had a lot of popular support in Florida, um, but it is because there's this tension between the individual right of free speech and free access to information on the, on the one hand versus the majority's right to make curricular decisions on the other hand. And the Supreme Court has very rarely grappled with this issue. Um, it has basically set, given us two broad guidelines. Uh, it says, on the one hand, these curricular decisions and decisions about what books go into libraries, by the way, uh, are basically entrusted to local government, whether it be the local school board, whether it be you know a statewide uh, board that's responsible for education or the state legislature. And courts should defer to the majoritarian decisions. I mean, this is grassroots democracy in action. Your local school board kind of epitomizes it. How that, and so the Supreme Court has said we're only rarely going to strike down a decision by school boards and, and other local school officials, including legislatures, and we will only do that when First Amendment rights are sharply and directly implemented. So those are the basic guidelines, but as with all of constitutional law and First Amendment law, the devil is in the details. How do you apply that in a particular situation? Um, and there, the Supreme Court has had only one decision that involved the issue of removing books from or adding books to either a school curriculum or a school library. And it happened to be a case, it was an ACLU case from New York, and it involved the removal 
of certain books from a public library. And that court was very deeply split, showing how difficult the issue was. They didn't even have a majority opinion. There were just I mean, four votes was the largest number of votes that uh, an opinion got. And basically, the one point that they all agreed on is that the determinative factor for deciding whether a curricular or library decision violates the First Amendment, and therefore the court can strike it down, is what is the purpose for the removal? So if the purpose is a legitimate educational purpose, that a professional librarian or you know, a duly designated committee of uh, parents and teachers and librarians and educational experts decided under regular procedures that the book was educationally unsuitable or age inappropriate, that would be a legitimate permissible reason for removing it. If, in contrast, the reason for removing it is discriminatory either against the ideas in the book or against the author of the book, let's say because of race, gender, politics, or so forth, that's an illegitimate reason, and therefore the decision would have to be overturned. Um, as to the details about the extent to which private schools can be regulated, Jessica, I'm not an expert there, but I would say um, there the, the decision is even more complicated because there is a First Amendment freedom of association, which often also includes a free exercise of religion, because a lot of private schools are based on shared religious values, so that not only do the individual students and parents have First Amendment rights, but the school as an entity has its own First Amendment rights, so you have to balance yet an additional factor. Thank you. I think these issues of free speech in schools is not really a, there's not a right answer or a wrong answer. It's not a black and white issue at all. So thank you. So when you were discussing, you mentioned the framers. Uh, and I was reminded about the discussion that was had being had by the framers about the Constitution and rights. Federalism versus anti-federalists, right? This idea that rights should be mentioned in the Constitution uh, against the idea that rights shouldn't be because if you put a number to rights, then you're limited to those rights. Uh, now we have this discussion about the First Amendment, but we've also talked about this majority, which caught my attention. Because it wasn't always that we were voting for senators, right? It was a time and place where uh, people didn't have the right to vote for senators. Uh, so if you would like to discuss that a little bit, that'd be great. Sure. Um, you know, one of the, the Constitution is obviously a flawed document as anything from uh, well, us flawed human beings it is not perfect. But one of the positive aspects of the Constitution is that the framers recognize their fallibility and included a provision for amending it. And they struck, here's a phrase that comes up a lot in constitutional law, uh, a delicate balance, right? I've already referred to that concept uh, in the balance between majorities of rights on one, power on the one hand and individual rights on the other hand. In terms of uh, the amendment process, on the one hand, you want to make it quite difficult to amend the Constitution because that's what makes it special, distinguished from other laws which can be amended or repealed by a simple majority vote. And especially if you want to have enduring principles that will stand the test of time and shifting political winds and majoritarian pressures, you want to make it harder to amend we sometimes use the term entrenched, that the Constitution is an especially entrenched law. On the other hand, you don't want to make it so hard that when, as hopefully, as we uh, progress as, as individuals and as societies uh, and as communities, 
uh, what seemed to be just and efficient and effective and workable in the past no longer is, and we have the tools available to uh, amend the Constitution. And a very high percentage of all amendments to the Constitution have been for purposes of not only increasing democratic participation, which is what, uh, and Michael refers to a very important example of allowing a popular, that is by the people, election of senators as opposed to having them being elected by state legislatures as under the original Constitution. Uh, but so many of the amendments protect individual rights that were not expressly enumerated in the original Constitution and the rights of groups of people that were originally excluded from the original Constitution. And uh, I think that that's, uh, it, it, you know, sometimes people get frustrated with the Supreme Court because of various decisions that it makes in interpreting or we may think misinterpreting the Constitution uh, and say, you know, it's too bad that the Supreme Court has the final word on the Constitution. constitutional amendment process, we have the final word. And historically, Supreme Court decisions that have been anti-human rights have been overturned. Thank you, Matthew, you know that from your study of history. Have been overturned by amendments to the Constitution, including uh, the 13th Amendment, which abolished uh, slavery, the 14th Amendment, which established equal protection of the laws and that anybody born in this country or naturalized as a citizen, that was expressly to overturn the infamous Dred Scott decision. So I think it's really empowering for all of, all of us to know uh, that we truly can affect this Constitution at the most profound level and thank the framers for giving us that power. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's always this idea that, oh, I shouldn't go vote because I don't, like, what's my vote going to do? But in reality, like, we have to use our right to vote if we have the right to vote, and we have to make sure that we are uh, just participatory in our civics and be participatory around the government in our city. Uh, you mentioned George Orwell's 1984, and when I was first hearing about this conversation, this discussion we're having today, first thing that came to mind was George Orwell, 1984, and Newsweek, which we talked about a little bit, which is like, the confusing and straining ability, right, to talk. Just limiting our vocabulary to the point where it diminishes our creativity and our way to express ourselves. Uh, in your first chapter, you say, no matter how speech protective our laws might be, freedom of speech still will not be a vital reality unless we reinforce free speech law with the free speech culture in which individuals actually exercise and support free speech. And then you go on to quote George Orwell, say, if large numbers of people believe in freedom of speech, there would be freedom of speech even if the law forbids it. But if public opinion is sluggish, which is a great word, <laughs> inconvenient minorities will be prosecuted, even if the law exists to protect them. So my question with this is, how do we bring awareness and create a culture that advocates free speech than one that just sits on the sidelines? You know, this is where all, Michael, you, as well as um, Jessica, Crystal, all the rest of you who are teachers or are uh, in the process of becoming teachers, you make such a difference. Uh, even, you know, it's interesting, you started that question by making a persuasive argument for why people should participate not only in uh, the political process through speaking, but through voting, which is a very important form of expression. And I was just thinking of so many examples of local elections that have turned on so few votes. And you know, if you want to make a concrete case to people, not just hypothetical, you can give so many examples where issues that are of dramatic importance, including going back to your great questions, Jessica, of the curricular issues and issues about library board policies. These are decided at the local level. Most people are more directly affected by what's happening where they really, the school board election, library board election. Um, but um, so the, having a strong free speech law, as we by and large, 
required to do. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court now, it's not perfect, uh, but it has given us the most speech protective law that we've ever had in history or that any country has ever had in history. And what I find interesting about that is, as you all well know from reading and watching about it, the court is highly divided on, on just about every controversial issue involving constitutional law. But on freedom of speech, not so much. You get case after case where the justices from the most liberal to the most conservative are voting to protect freedom for a highly controversial speech that large percentages of the general population want to ban. So we get uh, all across the ideological spectrum. They support freedom for hate speech, for disinformation, for terrorist speech, for extremist speech, for pornography. Um, and that's why I wrote my book, by, uh, by the way, because as I was trying to figure out why this disparity between the justices who have almost nothing else in common with each other, but they do all support free speech and the disparity between them as a group and the public at large, I thought, well, the justices know what the law is. And they also probably are familiar with the history that gave rise to the law. So even though I will never advocate or indoctrinate in my classrooms, to me that's different from educating, I did come to see that even educating about free speech becomes a type of advocacy because the more people know about it, the more they tend to support it. Um, and so I would say anything that you can do, not only to teach about, but to give students the opportunity to experience and exercise their free speech, to empower them, to express themselves to listen to other people because freedom of speech involves not only the right to convey information and ideas, but also the right to receive information and ideas. So listening is very important and engaging in communication and dialogue and discussion and different perspectives and asking questions and dissenting. I think you know that's something that students would enjoy. And that can really make free speech bring it to life so that they will come to support it and help to create a free speech culture as opposed to what is often called cancel culture where there is so much pressure on people to not express themselves for fear that they might be subject to some kind of disproportionately harsh response. Thank you for that. Um, you said the word dissent, and it just made me think about it, like just a little tangent. I went to the Statue of Liberty with my son this summer, and um, one of the like parts of the exhibit in the Statue of Liberty, like at the museum, is the is like, what are your favorite things about America? And then one of the things was dissent, and I just thought that was super interesting that they'd have that there, like the ability to be able to like say, you know, protest, and all. I think that was amazing. One of my favorite statements is from uh, Thomas Jefferson, another flawed framer, but I think he contributed far more positive than, than negative by far. Um, and one of his statements, because uh, as they, um, being so involved in the ACLU and FIRE and other free speech organizations, I'm typically defending freedom for people who dissent. If you say something that's popular, you're not going to be subject to censorship. So. Um, and, and often, when we're in a time of national security crisis, um, to dissent becomes very unpopular. You're accused of being unpatriotic or even treasonous. And so one of my favorite statements is from Thomas Jefferson, who said, dissent is the highest form of patriotism. And think about the logic of that, because we depend on dissenting individuals to hold their government officials who are accountable to us. We wield the sovereign power. Um, and we can't do that unless we are free to dissent and criticize them. Yeah, and if we don't dissent, then the American Revolution doesn't happen. So I think that's kind of what Thomas Jefferson's going there. <laughs> True. I, um, 
And it's funny because when I was at the museum, there was a lot of people from, you know, international, like just from everywhere, and they were wondering what that meant. And they were like, oh yeah, it's a thing here. And I just, I just <coughs> took me back to our conversation last year around this time when we had the panel discussion about free speech. And uh, we had Eric Heitz, right? Heitz uh, coming over from an international perspective, reminding us that this free speech law that we have, but like other countries don't have this. So let, like, let's really look at it and appreciate what we can from it. You know, um, to sort of com combine a couple of the questions and excellent points that, that, that you've been making, the concept of dissent it doesn't exist in many other countries, and the word for it also doesn't exist, going back to the Newspeak concept. I know you're gonna ask me about um, this documentary film series, so I won't steal your thunder from the question, but one of the episodes there involves a young woman, I'd say she's about the age of graduate students here, um, in here, uh, who uh, was born in North Korea, and astoundingly, she and her family escaped from North Korea when she was an adolescent. I say astoundingly because she talks about how they do not have a word for freedom. They certainly don't have a word for dissent. They don't have a word for civil liberties or human rights, they don't even have a word for love. She said she never heard her parents express love for each other or for herself, and this is something else that's quote Orwellian, right, um, uh, Michael? And, and that's why I say astoundingly, if you, if you don't even have, the, so the reason that the words are banned both in North Korea in 1984 is if the vocabulary goes away, the idea is that the concept will go away. And I think to a large extent that's true, but obviously not completely, because she and her family somehow had this idea that they could escape and come to this country. Um, speaking of the, because uh, we were talking previously about how we have this you know, special constitution, right, that we, to change it would make it like not so special anymore, to be able to like just easily, you know, change it. Um, and then I was reading some articles about revisionists, like how they don't wanna, they might wanna change some things and just kind of like um, alter the words and stuff of the constitution. But I just had a question about um, what you thought were the, out of your whole book, how if, if you break it down with all the questions, right? Questions and some questions. What are the most challenging questions when it comes to the First Amendment? <laughs> uh, yes, so my new book is part of a trademarked series published by Oxford University Press. That is the name of the series is trademarked and it's what everyone needs to know. And then that's the subtitle and then the main title is whatever the subject is. So my, my topic is free speech, what everyone needs to know. And it's deliberately in question and answer format. And I love that because for me, and this is why I love this format, thanks to all of you for participating in it with me, pontificating or lecturing is, you know, it's great, but it's not as good as a dialogue and an exchange for embodying uh, the free speech idea and one of the things that I've treasured in all of my exchanges about free speech all over this country and all over the world are the hardest questions. Please give me the hardest questions because I don't want my um, protection or advocacy for speech to be wrong. I could be wrong, so you know, prove me wrong. I don't want it to be um, uh, a dead dogma. Now I'm paraphrasing John Stuart Mill's famous on um, liberty defense for questioning everything, especially the ideas that we're most deeply attached to, because even if we reaffirm our beliefs after questioning, we'll be able to defend them in a more invigorated way. So I think, you know, at the first substantive chapter in my book is exactly that. What are, I, I limited it to 12 because we had space limitations. Uh, what are the 12 hardest most important arguments against free speech and what are the strongest counter arguments. And I listed them pretty much in order of importance based on my own assessment but also what I get from, from 
people all over the world. Um, and so if you boil down First Amendment law to its essentials, it does empower government appropriately to restrict the speech that is the most dangerous, speech that poses an emergency. That's a term that we often use. Uh, speech that directly and imminently causes or threatens certain specific serious harm. And the Supreme Court has recognized several subcategories of speech that satisfy that emergency test. Some of these will sound familiar to you. Intentional incitement of imminent violent or lawless conduct that's likely to happen uh, imminently. Targeted harassment or bullying. Uh, a true threat where the speaker aims at a particular individual or small group of individuals and intends to instill a reasonable fear that they're going to be subject to attack. The speaker doesn't have to intend to carry out the attack, but if you reasonably, that is objectively, fear that you are going to be subject to attack, that already impairs your freedom uh, and your privacy and your dignity. So uh, to summarize all of that, the government may impose emergency restrictions on speech because of the tight and direct connection between the speech and imminent harm. So to me, the hardest question is this. Well, a lot of speech that doesn't satisfy the emergency principle is still really harmful. It can indirectly, at some future point, combined with other speech, lead to harm in the near term. It can cause emotional distress and trauma in the longer term. It may persuade people to adopt nefarious ideas, including discriminatory ideas, including um, violent uh, ideologies. And that may lead people to actually engage in nefarious conduct, including discrimination and violence. And I completely agree that a lot of non-emergency speech can be very harmful. So why do I nonetheless oppose empowering the government to restrict non-emergency speech? That to me is the single hardest question. And it's basically a way of saying, you know, why don't you defend what happens to be the current First Amendment law, which I defend not because it's the current First Amendment law, but because I think it makes a lot of common sense. Um, and the answer really comes down to um, again, a delicate balance or, you know, weighing the costs and benefits. Uh, and I can best summarize it by quoting a phrase that I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard Winston Churchill's famous aphorism about democracy when he said, it's the worst form of government except for all the others. And I would say, you know, allowing non-emergency speech out there and preventing the government from restricting it is really the worst approach we can have, except for empowering the government to restrict non-emergency speech. And that is what we used to do until the second half of the 20th century. And that's what a lot of governments still do. Uh, the test is generally called the bad tendency test. It's quite accurate um, and descriptive. If speech has a tendency to perhaps, at some point, contribute to some harm, then that's enough to justify suppressing it. That may sound great, but when you think about the essentially unconstrained discretion that gives to government, which, going back to an earlier point, is appropriately accountable to the majority or to powerful interest groups in a particular community, you can predict that with that vague and broad and malleable standard, it is going to be enforced disproportionately against minority viewpoints. The dissenters, 
those who lack political power, religious minorities, racial minorities, and so forth. And that is exactly the history that we have in this country. Until the Supreme Court began to robustly protect the emergency principle um, in the context of the civil rights movement, no coincidence that case after case after case involved civil rights demonstrators who were being suppressed under the bad tendency test. And you know, you can read those decisions, the southern officials, and by the way, some northern officials as well, were arguing that that speech causes emotional distress. Uh, that speech is disinformation and defamation and subversion and you know, treasonous and anti-patriotic and so forth. Uh, and that argument had prevailed and resulted in censorship of every movement for social justice and equality uh, and every dissenting movement throughout our history, including abolitionists and women's suffragists and anti-war protesters and labor union organizers, um, uh, advocates of LGBTQ rights, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And you, you did talk about the emergency test, right? Like, uh, if it violates a certain amount, like, uh, intentional incitement of imminent or violent or lawless conduct. Um, so what restrictions are there? Because you did also mention in the book that there, what is not covered under the free speech, you know, amendment is, uh, is covered in other parts of the Constitution. What, what other protections do we have that are not protected under the free speech? or something like mental health issues or incitement of violence, things like that. I'm not positive I understand your question, Crystal, so please you know, follow up if, uh, if I'm not hitting it on target. But um, first of all, I would say, and I'm gonna repeat it, but it bears repeating, whatever the other cause is, whether it be mental health or emotional health, I think you referred to those, you can't advance those unless you have robust freedom of speech. That is the essential engine. And, and I should refer to not only freedom of speech, but the other First Amendment rights, which include freedom of assembly and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. So any kind of act, and then there are, of course, also protections for religious liberty in the First Amendment, but specifically in terms of advocating for any cause, including any other right, you need free speech. I would say the single other most important constitutional provision, not coincidentally, wasn't added until after the Civil War, and that's the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. You know, somewhat shockingly, I think, you know, for a nation that has always professed, uh, at least at some level, liberty and justice for all, we, we know that the all uh, did, were not protected by the original Constitution, uh, but there was no guarantee of equality at all until after the Civil War. And, the Equal Protection Clause, I think is really important, going back to concepts that I think all three of you have alluded to, to have a meaningful free speech. It's not enough that we, so the First Amendment is framed in negative terms. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And by the way, the word Congress has been interpreted to me all government officials at, at all levels, but it's negative, right? But if we were to have meaningful free speech, I think of it as a more affirmative, proactive concept that we really want to, and this is where all of you educators come in, we really want to empower and encourage and inspire and equip every single member of our society to actually exercise meaningful freedom of speech. And that means providing, and, and these are values that accord more with the Equal Protection Clause. You know, we provide the education, we provide the technological resources, the psychological resources. Thank you. Um, speaking to that, education um, and uh, bringing awareness, you served as host and project consultant for the three-hour documentary series about free speech, free to speak is the title. Um, so what can you tell us about this film series? And, 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 it, and first of all, it is now available. I'll have to update my 
uh, biography. It, uh, it's airing on public TV stations all over the country, so you can look at your local listings uh, to find what it's airing in your region. But it's also available on YouTube, at least the first um, uh, part of the, the three-part series, and then next week, the second part and the third part. And what I really love about it, I can't get credit for this, I'm just simply the narrator, um, the, the, the film crew was unbelievable. They traveled all over the world and for a couple of years, uh, interviewed the most amazing, heroic individuals who have really uh, suffered and, um, and worked uh, and endured, in, in some cases didn't endure, sadly, um, were killed. Uh, for trying to exercise their free speech rights. But what's so interesting about it is it, it, it involves dozens of episodes in dozens of countries, literally every single continent except Antarctica, uh, from different historical periods, people with very, you know every kind of person, every demographic group, racial, religious, ethnic, age, you name it, very different topics, very different perspectives. And so what comes through is the universality of the human drive for freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry, freedom of expression, freedom of association, but also comes through you know, a, a, a countervailing concern about, well, speech is dangerous, speech is harmful, speech is frightening, let's try to rein it in. And I think the film series is excellent in giving uh, very strong countervailing perspectives. You know, so uh, for example, on the hate speech episode, with which, which is very close to the beginning of the first uh, part, you have experts from Germany talking about, based on their history, how we ought to outlaw Nazi speech and other white supremacist speech, and then there are countervailing perspectives from, from this country. Um, and one of the things that's great about this film series is that uh, if you go to the website associated with it, there are all kinds of educational resources. It's really aimed to get into the schools, get into the libraries, get into community groups. So um, there are discussion questions, there is a toolkit for creating discussions, there are clips so you can take different topics, subtopics uh, from the film series and just have a screening and a discussion based on that. So again, uh, for this audience, I think it would be especially uh, an exciting, you know, a way to bring free speech alive, not just words uh, on an old piece of parchment. Right, we were talking about that earlier, about how to uh, bring it into the classroom, and I'm, I'm excited to take a look at that and show it to my students. Um, so thank you for answering our questions. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite anybody uh, from the audience to come up to the mic and ask, uh, join the conversation and ask your own questions. Um, we're going to be, we have a video recording of the event that's going to be posted on the library YouTube channel. So I just ask that you speak directly into the mic so that the recording can hear you. Um, anybody can just walk up. I'll get us started. Um, others can follow. Um, Nadine, I'm wondering, um, as, as a professor yourself, um, what you aim to not indoctrinate but educate, and what you aim to incorporate diverse viewpoints um, and controversial perspectives in your classes, including ones that you find uh, totally disagreeable, um, how, how do you actually do that? What are some teaching methods or tools or frameworks that you would offer um, to educators who are open to these ideas, but one are wondering how to actually practically go about that. Thank you so much, and a, a mantra, say the mantra for all of my students uh, throughout the decades, and I have a course manual that keeps getting longer and longer, but what, from the beginning, it has always included as the key mantra that you are expected to be able to understand, articulate, and advocate all plausible perspectives on all issues. 
And by plausible perspectives, I mean something that is grounded in whatever the verification tools are for your particular subject area. I teach constitutional law, so a plausible perspective would have to be grounded on the language of the Constitution, analysis or interpretation of that language, which much of it is open textured and subject to different interpretations, um, Supreme Court precedents, um, and analysis of Supreme Court precedents. And I work this through the class and by um, asking, so I'll ask, and, and in the Supreme Court cases that are our course material in constitutional law are particularly well suited for this, but one could do it, I believe, with every other uh, topic. I've even been told science and math can be taught this way. But in uh, Supreme Court decisions, you usually have not only the majority opinion, but also one or more dissents and one or more concurrences, so different perspectives are laid out there. But even if the court itself were unanimous, you can go back and read briefs from the um, opposing parties. But I would expect people to be able to try to come up with the um, analysis on their own. So even as we're looking at words in the Constitution, I'll ask them, you know, what are the different ways that you could interpret the words? Every single word in the First Amendment free speech clause has been subject to debate. Congress, I already told you, what does Congress mean? It turns out it doesn't mean Congress. The majority of the court has said it means a lot of other uh, government bodies, but that's a, a result of debate, right? Shall make no law. What is law? Uh, abridging the freedom of speech. By the way, the word the has been subject to debate. Antonin Scalia said, well, they weren't just talking about freedom of speech in some loosey-goosey way. They had a specific concept in mind, the freedom of speech, and that shows that it was whatever the concept was at the time that the uh, First Amendment was adopted and so forth. So um, if a student, uh, uh, I will ask a student, you know, make the strongest possible argument you can make in favor of X conclusion, and then I will ask the same student, now make the strongest plausible counter argument. And I find that that has worked so well, and not only because it um, gets the students to really think and stretch the bounds of their um, analysis, their, their critical thinking abilities, but it also dissociates the student from a particular perspective. I, I'm not asking them what they think, what their views are. And that has proven to be especially important in this time of polarization when students are afraid to be seen as advocating unpopular views. I want them to be able to do that, but that's not necessary for the class. For the class, they're being devil's advocate. Um, they don't have to say, I agree with this or I disagree with it. I am making the strongest plausible argument that can be made. should be uh, treated as 
public forums open to anybody who has any idea, no matter how unpopular that idea might be. And the public forums are classically public parks and streets. Even there, government may impose what are called content neutral time, place, and matter restrictions. Content neutral means the government can never say, you're not allowed to speak in a public park because we dislike your perspective. But they are allowed to say, nobody may speak um, using a microphone in a public park in the middle of the night in a residential neighborhood because that disturbs peace and quiet. Uh, but when you get beyond the public forums, Nobody has a right to speak at a particular event or in a particular venue. I have no right to speak here. I'm enormously privileged to have been invited to speak here. And uh, given that there's a finite number of, of rooms and hours and attention span, it's a curated decision, just the way librarians and teachers are always making curating decisions. You know, what are the speakers and ideas and books that we think are worthy of attention? And, you know, given the finite uh, space and finite, finite attention span, and you're not being censored if you're not invited to, to one of those platforms. That said, um, this goes back to that excellent question about curricular decisions. If, um, if the only reason for not inviting somebody is that their ideas are unpopular, I think that's, that's, that's not ideal. I think that we should expose um, students and other audiences to even unpopular ideas if there is a legitimate pedagogical reason. So let me take one pretty dramatic example. Uh, on many campuses, Donald Trump is extremely unpopular. And he is extremely popular in many other venues, including among many voters. And I think it would be completely legitimate for a campus to invite him to speak in a forum in which he would be subject to counter perspectives and questions and answers. Uh, not despite his, his lack of popularity, but precisely because of it. I think it would be educational for students to have a close-up opportunity to engage with this person uh, whose views they deplore, but many other people applaud. But that's not a right. That's, to me, a, a matter of judgment and, and policy. Um, in terms of consequences, of course there are consequences to free speech. Uh, there are consequences coming from speech. I think I really acknowledge, as the Supreme Court has, that even speech that doesn't satisfy the emergency standard can be very harmful, as I said. And, and, the, and the court itself acknowledges that. There was a, its most, one of its most recent decisions about hate speech involved the Westboro Baptist Church. I don't know if you all know what that is. Um, anti-gay, anti-Catholic, anti-military, basically against anybody who wasn't a member of their church. And the Supreme Court upheld their right to engage in very derogatory, hateful, discriminatory speech, saying we know that this speech is harmful. Uh, the plaintiff in the case had expert witnesses testifying to the adverse psychological impact on him of hearing this speech, which had adverse physiological manifestations. And the court expressly acknowledged that repeatedly, but it said it would be even more harmful if we allowed the government on the basis of that kind of emotional reaction uh, to punish speech because, you know, by the way, mentioning Donald Trump, I know many people who feel uh, psychologically or emotionally adversely impacted by hearing things that he said. And I don't think that that would justify, um, you know, punishing his speech in, our, in a democratic republic. So it's uh, a question of, of cost and balances. And I don't mean to be singling out Donald Trump uh, unfairly. I mean, I believe that 
unfortunately or fortunately, with our vigorous debate, every single uh, political candidate has understandably said things that are emotionally upsetting and disturbing to, uh, to many individuals and, and sectors of population. So anyway, consequences for, uh, for, for, for speech that is upsetting or offensive or harmful should not be censorship, but they certainly should be criticism, including extremely strong and harsh criticism, including defamatory criticism. In one of the most famous cases, and you, Matthew, the name of the case, Times versus Sullivan, right? The Supreme Court said if the defamatory falsehood is about a public official, that's constitutionally protected because we want to err in favor of encouraging criticism and of public officials, and we don't want people to be chilled for fear that it might be found that they crossed the line. Um, and uh, defamatory criticism, and I would also say even advocating for people to lose their jobs, even advocating for students to be suspended. I oppose that. I think that's a disproportionately harsh response, but I would defend other people's free speech rights to advocate for a more punitive response. So, you know, I'm sorry I'm going on and on because it's so complicated. Uh, to say that you have the right to do something, including advocating that somebody be punished, you know, really harsh consequences for speech, not, not punished by the government, but let's say by a private institution, a private employer, doesn't mean that you should do that. And, and I would urge, if we're going to go beyond the law and have a meaningful free speech culture, especially in an academic environment, I would say please don't advocate for the harshest consequences. Please try to use the same restorative justice approach that we have now been using in so many other contexts. Please give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Please try to persuade, not try to coerce or bully. So what you open, thank you. What you open could be fruit for you know a really long discussion in and of, of itself, a very important topic. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to hear your, you know, in the real world, um, and going back to how I teach, I wouldn't answer any of these questions. I would sincerely say, what do you think about that? What's your best answer to your question? And that seriously is something that I require of all of my students. Um, when they come to class, they are required the day before the class to submit in writing three, what they, the three hardest questions about the reading assignment, what you know, they found the most puzzling, challenging questions. And I ask them to formulate in their minds what their best answer would be. I don't require them to write it out, uh, but I require them to have thought through it so that when we discuss in the class, they're not just passive vessels for my answer. They will have wrestled through it on their own. And I would then ask for the other students, you know, what's your best answer to that question? And then if hopefully I can build on that and, you know, fill in some gaps, sometimes I can. Sometimes the students come up with a better answer than I could my own. But it's all to stimulate their thinking rather than just passive receptivity. So what stuck out to me was uh, the idea of platform for your question. And you mentioned public forums and spaces. Uh, what about the private forum in the private space when we don't uh, agree to the terms and services that we click on but don't really necessarily read, right? Um, my question would be, uh, well, first, before I talk about the question you mentioned in the book, to be sure, the First Amendment does not directly constrain online platforms because they are private sector entities. Nonetheless, given the platform's enormous power over the political speech that is the lifeblood of our democracy, free speech should be protected for platforms, customers and non-customers through other means, and you go on to tell the other means. So the question I have is, how can free speech be protected under the private sector? Yeah, it's a really important topic. I think now most people know, because we've had so much discussion about social media, 
what used to be a very arcane constitutional law doctrine, the so-called state action doctrine, uh, that the First Amendment only constrains state in the sense of government actors. And so if you're a private university or a private corporation, whether it uh, be a newspaper or a social media platform or, or, or anything else, um, not only do you have no obligation to protect anybody else's free speech rights, but if you're engaged in the business of communication, as the social media certainly are, you have your own First Amendment rights, and those include editorial discretion, going back to your question, not to platform a particular speaker, not to platform a particular idea. Uh, and. I am very supportive of um, the rights, uh, I'm not anti-capitalist, and I am supportive of the, of the rights of private sector entities to make their own decisions, um, respectful of what they think their audiences want, but I am very concerned about the adverse practical impact of, uh, especially with increasing evidence and we know the trial with a couple antitrust uh, actions that are going on right now. The enormous power that these companies have amassed to become, in some ways, more powerful gatekeepers than most governments have been throughout history. And uh, I recently, last week, I spoke at the University of Chicago on the other side of town, and there were. Uh, an expert um, on online issues was saying that at every single level of the infrastructure, going down to uh, registration of domain names and security providers and web hosts, et cetera, that there's more and more concentration. And they are exercising, you know, deep infrastructure that is far removed from the, con the content level is now starting to engage in content selection. So we're not going to provide security services to speakers whose messages we disagree with. And this means as a practical matter, it becomes almost impossible to find an alternative way of getting your message out. It's hard enough to find another you know, social media platform, but it's even harder to find something deep down on the level of the, of the infrastructure. And given these difficulties, interestingly enough, law professors and economists and other experts all across the ideological spectrum have been advocating at least an exploration of certain potential regulatory solutions. I mean, it fascinates me that even libertarians who are against government regulation, but after all, economic libertarians, I understand, support a, a free functioning economic marketplace, right? So they would support um, antitrust regulations as interfering with an actual open marketplace. And some of the proposals include, which Congress is now very seriously examining, would include treating some of these companies as uh, public utilities or as common carriers, similar to what the way the landline telephone companies were treated in the last century, or the telegraph companies, uh, or railroads, that they are such essential infrastructure for meaningful participation in contemporary life that they have to be equally available, they have to be neutral conduits, right? Equally available to everybody in a non-discriminatory fashion. So just the way the landline phone company can't kick off the Ku Klux Klan or you know, the Nazi party or, or anybody else, uh, that the same would be true for the social media companies. So it's, I'm sorry, it's, there's no easy answer. And I think here, on the positive, Congress is in a bipartisan fashion, very seriously uh, in consultation with many experts engaging in, in studies. 
State legislatures are also proceeding. Um, two laws have been passed, which the Supreme Court is going to be reviewing next year. to 
uh, educate people about their free speech rights and defend their free speech rights, but how do you find out that they exist? And that's got to be a matter of marketing. Uh, and I say this, I'm quoting, I'm, I'm channeling a Yale law student who a couple of years ago very courageously spoke out uh, and stood up against the administration's attempts to punish him. He was a minority student, he was a uh, Cherokee student and Native American, and uh, he was also a conservative, that was another minority at Yale. Um, and uh, I asked him how he, you know, how did he have the courage to withstand this enormous pressure? He got quite a lot of national attention, so this may sound familiar. Um, two top administrators basically threatened that they would withhold the character and fitness recommendation that you need to get from your law school in order to be allowed to practice law. And he, they were so stupid, he captured it on his cell phone and it went viral. But, but still, that was such enormous pressure. How in the world did he stand up against it? And I had the chance to talk to him, and he said to me, he said, you, meaning <laughs> us older people who are involved with free speech organizations, he said, you have to do a better job of marketing that more students, but this would be true of other people to whom you referred as well, Crystal, would be more willing to exercise free speech if they knew that somebody had their back, if they knew that there are organizations that would advocate for them, even provide lawyers for them. And the preeminent organization that has been doing that on campus for more than 20 years now and recently has expanded beyond campus is FIRE. Uh, which used to be the foundation for individual rights in education, now is the foundation for individual rights in expression. And I think very wisely, uh, part of, and I'm a, I'm a senior fellow with FIRE, so you know, by disclaimer, I'm, I'm, I support it and I advocate for it. Um, they have a very robust marketing effort to educate people about what their free speech rights are and call on us if you believe that somebody is violating your free speech rights. So they have TV ads, and they have billboards, and they have you know, mobile trucks, and you know, reaching out to special audiences like on campus. And I think you know, visually very arresting, um, captivating ads. So um, that's what we have to do. Um, with that, I believe it's time to end our conversation with the Dean. Um, I would like to thank the NAIU Libraries for organizing this event and Voices for Liberty Initiative for funding the event, Jessica and Michael for helping me conduct this conversation, and to our audience uh, for your questions and contributions. Um, most of all, please join me in a round of applause for our speaker, Denise Strassen. Uh,